Let the game sevens begin. John Butchergrass, Barry Melrose, Ray Ferraro. Ray, you played with three game seven. What does the player think about? Most exciting time of the year. The, you can't be any more excited and ready to get going here. This is what you play for. And Barry, what are the coaches thinking about preparing their team? Well, first off, you know if you win, you probably got a job next year, which is very important. <laughs> uh, just, is there anything that I haven't done to prepare this team? That's what coaches think about. Is there anything I could have done to make us better in Game 7? So that's what's going through their mind. We have two big ones. We begin in Jersey. While the NHL considers dissolving the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Penguins on Tuesday were considering dissolving the New Jersey Devils. While the NHL considers asking a U.S. bankruptcy judge to begin the process of terminating the Penguins on Wednesday, the Penguins were hoping on Wednesday they would terminate the Devils. The NHL wants Mario Lemieux to be awarded the Penguins by the bankruptcy court. The Penguins wouldn't mind if Mario would suit up for Game 7 in New Jersey. Unsettled Steel Town trying to pull off the upset of the playoffs. And let's go to Jersey. And Matthew Barnaby doing his best to fire up his troops. Here we go, Tommy! Here we go, baby! Woo! Wayne Gretzky on hand, all-time leader in playoff goals, 122 all-time leader in autographs signed in this one. Early first, no score. The tragically Kit Miller to Jags. What a great catch by Herdina, but he runs out of reach. Just a bit wide. Barry, speak of the Devils. Well, the Devils had a great game plan against Jager. They know he's beat up, so they're going to punish him every time he touches the puck. In the first period, I thought they did a great job. But I thought they laxed it later in the game and let him start playing his game. Obviously, it had some effect early, but they didn't keep it up long enough. First minute of the second, Jag says, enough is enough, I'm defending myself. But he goes to the penalty box. As he just comes out of the box after serving the penalty, causing some commotion. And what a great play here. Straka to T-top, 1-0 Penguins. Later second, still 1-0. Patrick Eliash. What a move behind the net to Jason Arnott, who eventually pokes it in. 1-1. One, one. Ray, what a great play by Eliash, huh? It is a great play, and this is a line that hadn't scored much. He banks it off the back of the net around Straka. Warenka's got great position, but Arnott's just too big and strong, and he ties the game up. Penguins 2-8 in their last 10 playoff games with Straka. And what an amazing pass to Kovalev, who never looked down at the puck, and he beats Brodor 5-hole. 2-1 Pens, they're feeling good. Just 20 seconds left in the second. Jogger again to Herdina. And body language time, Barry. Well, that's a down bench right now. You don't give up a goal the last 20 seconds of a period. That's a killer. 3-1. Ryder Fatork decides to dress Dave Andrichuk Good for choice. Game 7. Excellent choice. 3-2. Jersey back in if they have some life. 5.40 left now. Who would get the next goal in a 3-2 game? What kind of line change was that? A two-on-none. Jogger, no, but he got it on goal, which was important. Straka safe. Penguins safe. Devils out. The groin that saved Pittsburgh. What lead singer Steve Summers is to sprung monkey, Yarmer Yager is to the Pens. Two assists for Jags and one giant emotional lift since his game six return. From Plumboro to McKeesport, Western PA is screaming, let's go Pens, while all of New Jersey can only exhale with frustration. If I, if I understood better, maybe if we all understood better what, happen, what happens over the past uh, three years, we probably wouldn't be in this situation. For us to start analyzing what really happened, it's going to take a few days because uh, uh, the important thing is to win four hockey games in a series, and we didn't. They did. And that's how I said it earlier, that's the bottom line. We, we've been the big time on the Darbar. We know we, are, we have a good team and we have we are, we have arm here and, uh, you know, we, we know we, we can play hockey and uh, we've been uh, confident in ourselves and we can we can do it. We know we can do it. I'm thrilled for these players. Um, you know, a lot of these guys have no playoff experience. Some of them have maybe one year. And uh, these, these are great moments for them to build on their career. Entering these playoffs, Marty Straka had seven goals in 40 career playoff games. In this series, he had six. Of course, his big hat trick in game three. Bobby Holik, no goals in his last 17 playoff games. Ray, you talked about this from the beginning of the series. It was the grit of the Devils, the ugly goals against the skill of the Penguins, and the skill won out. It sure did, and, and mainly one of the reasons it did win out was because Pittsburgh was very opportunistic. When Yager went down in the series, they found guys to step up. Marty Straka had the, the hat trick early in the series, the first game that Yager was out. He scored six goals in the series. He, he dominated unbelievably. You're going to see here, this, this goal here, New Jersey tries to, to get some four-check pressure on. This is how they grind it out. But look at Ian Moran. He's not going to, the puck is not going to stay on his stick more than a second. And this is the overtime in game six. Moran gets it quickly up to Straka. Straka beats 
Niedermeyer down the boards. Niedermeyer is one of the quickest skating defensemen in the league, one of the most agile guys. But Straka has speed and skill. When he gets around him, he's got a clear lane to the net. Scott Stevens is coming back, but he's now chasing the play. And who gets open? Number 68, pretty good hockey player. He gets a chance and he throws it upstairs. Pittsburgh was able to win this series because their, their skill level took them to doing things that New Jersey couldn't do. And when New, New Jersey made a mistake, Pittsburgh was able to capitalize it. Here's that line change you were talking about. It looks like a fire drill over at the bench. They got five guys standing over there. There is no New Jersey Devils on the ice at this time. Moran again opens the puck up, clears it up to Straka. Straka's gonna turn around and look who's coming up the middle of the ice again. It's 68. Straka turns around and you know for a minute I don't think he's gonna give it to him. He hits Yager and Niedermeyer comes off the bench. He's, he's a last gasp attempt to save the play. Straka moves it up to Yager. Yager's in. The, the thing with Niedermeyer here, he's just trying to get a stick on Yager. He doesn't even, not even concerned with Straka at this point. So when Yager's going to take the shot, the rebound bounces by Niedermeyer. And that is great hands to take the puck, move it forehand to backhand, and put it in. And then Straka goes and does his best slide. I don't know if they play baseball over there, but, <laughs> you know, I, I guess really, you know, it, 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 that's a great moment for Pittsburgh. That puts the series away. And they were able to beat New Jersey because they were better skilled. They hung around all the time. They didn't, when New Jersey made a mistake, Pittsburgh was able to capitalize on it. New Jersey 5-12 and 12 in their last 17 playoff games. Barry, whose fault is it on that line change? Well, it's the players, uh, the defensemen. You've got to watch the puck. You've got to make sure that the puck is deep in the zone. Uh, and this is something that happens every game. Uh, so this isn't something that just happened tonight. Uh, for some reason, there was a brain cramp among the New Jersey defensemen. They didn't think, they thought the puck was in, obviously, and they made a terrible change. And that's winning and losing. But every time they made a mistake tonight, it was in their net. And that's what Pittsburgh does to you. They don't need a lot of mistakes in order to score a lot of goals. They need a couple mistakes, and they got two goals. Three mistakes, they got three goals. That's what Pittsburgh does to you. Just like Ottawa did this to them last year. Same type team, an offensive team with a lot of skill. You make a mistake against Ottawa, Yashin gets it, or a guy like Alfredson gets it and it's in your net. So they played two similar teams the last two years, and those offensive teams that don't do a lot of banging have beat them each year. Now it's on to the Leafs, and well, that should be a great series. Yeah, More on that in this half hour. Coming up on the NHL tonight, will Jeremy raise his arms in a V and play for the Coyotes in Game 7 against the Blues? That was the buzz around Phoenix. The answer and the highlights of that Game 7 are next. Probably should have come down to seven. If, if justice is served, I think both teams have played hard. Both teams have played well. Um, I would tell you I'll stake my job on it, but that's already been done. So I'll just say we're going to win game seven. So there it is. Jim Schoenfeld has guaranteed the Coyotes will win game seven against the Blues. The hot desert rumor is that Schoenfeld has to beat the Blues in game seven to keep his head coaching job. So playing along with the conventional wisdom, the Coyote coach, much like Ron Wilson, confronted the Capitals' playoff demons last year, decided to take the issue head on. No waffling, no depending on what the definition of is, is stuff. Take the monster head on and take your chances, and that's what he did. But he did have Jeremy on his side as Barry Melrose first reported. Jeremy would play, and he did play. Schoenfeld hoping he can help them win Game 7. First period, golden chance for St. Louis. Blues in the power play, and Jeff Cortnell stars in the postman. Ray, this is a close one. It is. Good pass out of the corner. Cortnell's got a great shot. He gets good wood on it. Habibulin doesn't get anything on it, but it's all goal post. Jeremy played well in this game. A lot of energy, naturally, but he's denied by Grant Fuhr. No score after one. Second period, Joe Quenville turns to his man, Barry. Well, right here you see Joe on the bench, well-dressed young coach. Puck goes to Rick Tockett. They need Tockett to get hot if they're going to win this game. But Grant Fuhr, the old man in net, just like you said, destiny or deja vu. I like that sign. That's a good sign. Third period. Ray, let me hear your body talk. Well, I'll tell you, they want to bang these two defensemen. McGinnis and Pronger, they both go down. They get a couple of good hits here. Pronger throws a good jab back at Doan. They're still wrestling when they get up the ice. And this, this game turned physical in a hurry. Jeff Cortland got Diddick a little later on. That's right. Show it to. Was this just a case of using the right place at the right time? Yeah, you could say that. I mean, it's, it was a great play by Scott. I mean, uh, look at, and everybody went down, and, and Pearson was alone. And uh, I just went in front and tried to tip it. And, uh, you know, kind of lucky goal, but uh, it's a big win. Huge. Look at that excitement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a great win. Thank Peter Terjean, congratulations on a momentous game-winning goal. Thanks, guys. Not good news, Coyote fans. The all-time record for consecutive series losses is 10 by the Montreal Canadiens of all organizations. Between 32 and 43, the Rangers went from 50 to 70, losing nine consecutive. 
The Winnipeg Jets slash Phoenix Coyotes have now lost nine consecutive playoff series. Barry, you said the Penguins and Blues both would win. Why did you think St. Louis would uh, win over Phoenix? For the same reason I thought Pittsburgh would win. I'm a big believer in momentum. A, a team that wins a game six usually has everything going their way. Uh, they believe in themselves. They're confident. Uh, the injuries don't bother you as bad. You're not as tired after a win. Uh, everything is going that team's way. And St. Louis has battled all year long. If you look at St. Louis, uh, how they got into the playoffs, how they got the fifth spot, it was because they overcame a lot of things. They overcame injuries. They overcame uh, some guys not playing well. They brought guys in from the minors that no one uh, else wanted. And they just kept winning, winning, winning. And uh, you've got to believe in teams like that. And I love the goaltender. Grant Fuhrer has been here many times before. And I just felt that everything was right for that team to win. I thought Phoenix played great. I thought they showed a lot of courage. Uh, you got to give Jeremy Roenick kudos for coming and playing this game. I'd been disappointed if he didn't. But uh, I'm a big believer in momentum, and St. Louis had the momentum. Right. There's something about that St. Louis defense with Pronger and McGinnis back there. We saw it in overtime. Every time Phoenix made a rush, that they just enveloped them and just spit them back out. What is it playing against those two guys, uh, the, the blue liners for the Blues? They're both, they're both big. I mean, Pronger gets all the, the talk about how big he is, but McGinnis is 6'2 or 3. He's got a long reach as well. Pronger is huge out there. His stick seems to cover the whole ice. It, whenever you think you're around them, they're in position. There was only four minutes tonight when either Pronger, Pronger or McGinnis were not on the ice, and that was both in the first two periods. And St. Louis is one of those teams that they find a way to win. It's not always a star guy, but Pierre Turgeon answered a lot of critics in this series who said, you know, he can't play in the playoffs. He's a little soft. Well, eight points in the last six games shows very well. And one other thing, Phoenix, they had guys dropping like flies in the game, but they showed a lot of heart. They showed a lot of grit, and they should be proud of their hockey team because they played very well. Especially Ronick with that broken jaw going down, blocking shots face first. Great effort by Jeremy. Well, the second round matchups are set. When we come back, we take a look at the Eastern Conference matchups, break them down because this is the NHL tonight. The NHL has fined Flyers owner Ed Snyder $50,000 and coach Roger Nielsen $25,000 for their opinions of NHL officials, specifically Terry Gregson. Snyder said after the Flyers Game 6 loss to Toronto, quote, when the official decides a game, it is a disgrace. The NHL bylaws prohibit public statements criticizing officials. Well, our Eastern Conference matchups are set, and we begin with Pittsburgh and Toronto. Let's break this one down for you statistically first. And we see the Penguins and Maple Leafs split their four meetings this season. Each team had one blowout. These two have met in the playoffs just twice, 76 and 77. Toronto winning both. Toronto scored just nine goals in the six games against Philly. But, Ray, you think they'll score more than that against Pittsburgh. I do, because I, I believe these two teams are, are of, of all the teams in the playoffs, they're the most likely to play a rush game. Toronto actually got back in the series using their speed. This is game two against Philadelphia. They're a minute from going down 2 nothing. Stevie Thomas breaks up the side and scores a goal. They, they're a quick strike team when they get the chance. Sundin here in the regular season powers away from the defenseman and scores. I expect them to be able to get loose a little more against Pittsburgh than they were in their first series. And Cujo was fantastic. He allowed them to play a defensive style. Pittsburgh, on the other hand, they, they have the best player in hockey, and that's, Mar that's uh, Jagger. It's not Mario Lemieux anymore. And uh, <laughs> Jagger came back in game six. He, he dominated, dominates the game. He makes the players around him so much better. And with Kovalev, Straka, Tidoff, these are guys that, that should be able to, to do well in this series. Forget Toronto has home ice advantage. Maple Leafs, the highest remaining seed in the East. Friday, ESPN 2, 7 o'clock. It's game one. Penguins and Maple Leafs again right here on the news Friday at 7 o'clock. The other Eastern Conference semifinal, Bruins and Sabres. Sabres won four of five against the Bruins this season. Only Bruin win came in overtime. These teams have faced each other six times in the playoffs. Bruins won the first five. Buffalo eventually taking a playoff series the last time these two teams met. May Day, of course, the Buffalo sweep. Ray Bork, the Bruins' leading scorer in the first round. Michael Pekka for the Sabres. Barry, what do we got here? Well, my series is going to be nothing like Ray's series. This is going to be a series that probably decided by a goal every game. 1-0, 2-1. You've got great goaltending. We've got Dominic Hasek. We all know what this guy does to a team he's playing against. He alters your thinking, changes your shot. He'll probably do the same thing to Boston, although Pat Burns will try and change that. They've also got the best leader in hockey right now, I think, in Michael Pekka. This guy is the go-to guy for the team. He not only is the best defensive forward in the NHL, he's also a guy that leads their team in scoring in the playoffs. So he's going to have a great series. 
On the other end of the rink, Byron Defoe has had a great season and he had a great first round. Two shutouts in the first round, as a matter of fact. And I see no reason why this guy's going to stumble. Young forwards are going to be the key. Anson Carter, Joe Thornton, Allison, Samsonoff. These guys must continue to develop and play great if Boston's going to win. This series begins Thursday, 7.30. The Bruins have the home ice and their big win over Carolina. Their fans were roaring, giving them some home ice advantage. Can they carry it over? Can they break the curse of Dominic? Game one, ESPN, Thursday at 7.30. What is up with the West? The breakdown of the powerful Western Conference when we come back, including a much-anticipated Red Wing Avalanche series. Chris Osgood cereal, they're great. Detroit, Colorado, here we go. During the regular season, these teams split their four meetings, each one one on each other's home ice. They've met twice in the playoffs, both times conference finals. Colorado wins in 96, Detroit wins in 97. Joey Sackick, three goals in four games against Detroit this past season. Barry? Well, I think if Colorado's gonna win this series, above all, they gotta have the great goaltending that we come to expect out of Patrick Watt. He's got two con Smice, he's won a number of Stanley Cups. He's gonna have to be great because the Detroit Red Wings are great. Expect him to be there for his team. We always will, but I also think the power play for Colorado must be great. I don't think they're going to score a lot of goals five on five on the great Detroit team. So players like Sanders, Olsen, Joe Sackick, Peter Forsberg, players like that must be great on the power play. The key to Detroit is goaltending. Patrick Waugh must outplay this guy in net if Colorado's going to win. If he does, I think Colorado has a chance of beating Detroit. But Osgood, again, has won a Stanley Cup also, but he's going to have to be better this year than he was last year. Talk about the passion. We can't wait for this one to begin. And it's game one, Friday, 7.30. This one's on the Big E, ESPN. From Denver, they have home ice, Red Wings, and Avalanche. <laughs> Meanwhile, St. Louis and Dallas, Brett Hall against the Blues. Dallas won both meetings during the regular season. These teams have some playoff history. They've met 10 times since each franchise joined the NHL in 67. They have each won five. They last met in the first round of 94 with the star sweeping St. Louis. Ray Ferraro, what are the keys here? I think one of the biggest keys for Dallas is with the week off that they've had, they've had a chance to get some people back healthy. Pat Verbeek hasn't played in the playoffs. He'll be able to play in game one. Darian Hatcher, who's, who's their captain and leader, has served the last game of his suspension in game one. He'll play in game two. Carboneau's going to be back in this series. That's a big lift for them. And Richard Madfachuk, he's, he's healthy again. He's had a week to rest. St. Louis, their power play is going to have to carry them in this series. Al McGinnis had a great first round series. He's the leader of that hockey club. Their power play is the key. If they can get, if they can get to Dallas with some power play goals, they'll, they'll have a chance. And also, when you play a team that's as deep as Dallas, your goaltender must be great. So after their long overtime game, they got to fly to Dallas. Will they be too pooped to perform Thursday at 8? Dallas would love to get on the board early. You can watch it. Game 1, ESPN 2, Thursday, 8 o'clock. They'll be fine. Trivia time. Tonight's question. Can you name the last defenseman to lead the playoffs in scoring? Was it Al McKinnis, Ryan Leach, Robert Orr, or Denny Thompson? Today's Sports Century Classic Moment is brought to you by Burger King. In just their second year, the St. Louis Blues have made it to the Stanley Cup Finals, where they face the Montreal Canadiens juggernaut. In a penalty-ridden series, the Habs allow the Blues just three goals, dispatching them in four straight to win the Cup. As their leader, Henri Richard, drinks his full measure, the Canadiens celebrate their second straight Stanley Cup, fourth in five years, on May 4th, 1969. I went with E, Barry Melrose. Had a couple good years, you're right. Ray took Bobby Orr, and Barry took Denny Potvin. The answer is Brian Leach. Leachy in 94 led all playoff scores with 34 points. We were close. <laughs> Murray back, Sackick open, shot, save, rebound, score! Hey, no! Hey, no! Game winning goal! Colorado wins it in overtime! Detroit in round two. Shatan with it. Didn't snake through York. Following a big blast. Rebound. Score! Miroslav Shatan crosses the finish line in this marathon. Buffalo wins. 
This has to be one of the tightest first rounds since the NHL went to this current format in 1987. 23 of the 44 games played in the first round were decided by one goal, including, of course, 10 overtime games. We are on next Thursday following Blues and Stars. Already in the house, guest analyst Kevin Stevens, of course, Sabres, Bruins, Hollies, and a preview of Pittsburgh, Toronto, and Detroit, Colorado. There's only three things that you got to remember when you're shining the cup. It's this. Wax on, wax off, wax on. That was a trick question. You don't leave the wax on. There'd be a buildup. Our third star, Nikolai Hobby Bolin, a losing cause as Coyotes go down to the Blues. Second star, Grant Fuhr, sixth career playoff shutout. How's that? Great game for Grant. Martin Straka, number one star, one goal, two assists. Eight-seeded Pittsburgh knocks off number one, New Jersey. We're making a line change. Kevin Stevens in for Ray Ferraro. Oh, Ray's, for more size. Ray's going home. <laughs> Big moment for his son, Landon. Congratulations, Landon, and good luck. Thanks, Ray. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Marty Straka, good job. See you Thursday. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network. Go.com.